So we're talking about AI, 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 right? This is really a, kind of a, a, an interesting topic and more and more. And, uh, and the way you can view it differently, right? You can view it as uh, challenging or as an opportunity. So uh, let, let's dig into um, uh, our presentation. So a little bit of, uh, about DDN. So DDN is a, uh, uh, was founded by uh, Alex Buzari and myself about uh, 25 years ago. So we're both grads from Caltech. We met actually probably the first day at Caltech 40 years ago. So we're celebrating about 40 years. And we've been partners uh, for the past, uh, I guess, uh, uh, 35 years uh, once uh, we both graduated and finished our study. So the company DDN is uh, uh, privately held. Uh, it is a profit profitable, self-sustained business uh, with about a north of 1,000 people. And it's mostly an engineering company. So we, we focus very early on on uh, high performance computing. We saw there was an opportunity uh, to differentiate ourselves. Uh, a lot of people were talking about serial access. A lot of people were talking about just a, a business transaction. And we saw an opportunity in developing next new technologies with parallel access, satellite download, video. Uh, so you could see we were kind of a visionary because anybody that uh, we talked to at the time said, why the hell would you do that? This is you know, over 20 years ago. So we went on to develop uh, uh, ASICs, uh, caching algorithm, uh, very special uh, uh, devices called at the time the S2A. And as luck would have it, uh, the first customers would be NASA. Then uh, as soon as we deployed this at NASA in 2000, um, there's starting to be a, uh, you know, at the time, uh, I'm not even sure there was a, uh, cell phones, but basically uh, we started to have uh, phone calls between all the labs saying there's this new, this new technology coming out from this small company called DDN, and it's nothing short of astounding, right? So we started basically, uh, uh, fast forward, we started really uh, deploying that technology in most of the large labs, academia, EDU. So if you look at it, our background has always been delivering uh, solutions to places like Purdue, uh, places like uh, Caltech, Stanford, so on and so forth, but also government and then very large labs like Oak Ridge, Argonne, Lawrence Livermore. So uh, very strong engineering uh, background at DDN. Um, over 60, 65% of our staff is engineers. So this is not uh, usual, right? So we really view ourselves as a engineering-centric company delivering data storage solution at scale. Um, 20 years in the business, um, one of the things that we pride ourselves, and that's why we're still private, is we do things we're able to invest in technology. We're able to invest, we're a mature company, we still invest 17% of our R&D and just focused on parallel file system, on next generation file system that enable HPC and AI. Um, we are global. Um, I think even before COVID, we might not have been as affected by COVID as other companies because we've always learned that if you want talent, you got to take and hire the talent and groom and work with them wherever they are, right? The old days of moving people to work from uh, 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 San Francisco to LA or whatever are kind of gone. So we were fortunate in the case that uh, uh, we were able to really uh, keep operating uh, during COVID. And actually, in a way, if you look at us, it, it, it also made us a better company because we could not fly any more people all over the world to install system, manage system, and so forth. So that actually was a positive as well, per se. I mean, don't take me that COVID was positive, but at least for operation, it taught our companies it forced us into efficiency, into basically uh, communicating and delivering massive system and scale that kept on running uh, without basically being face-to-face uh, -face present. So um, we are cross, we, um, um, let's go into uh, some of the customers actually. So what we provide you know, from day one uh, has always been HPC, and now it's uh, not morphing, but HPC remains, but it's morphing into AI, right? What we're finding over the past four or five years is AI with the event of uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, first the A100 and now the H100, is driving a whole new economy. And so, um, you know, historically, uh, we work with the Fortune 500 government, EDU, and so forth, uh, to, uh, at the core of their research, research, simulation, uh, mostly HPC, those are the environments we've been driving. So, in a way, we accelerate AI and analytics uh, through digital transformation. 
So we connect to, uh, you know, uh, we have a long-standing relationship here at, uh, uh, at Purdue. I think we've been working together, Preston, for what, the past 10 years or so. So along and forth, so there's a real, uh, we, we feel connected to our customers. We want to learn what they do. We want to basically be there and, uh, and be present along the cycles. So, um, Actually, we were expecting to have students, but I guess they're at the job fair. So we have a couple slides for students, but I think it's still valid for you guys as faculty to understand what do we look in, in students, right? I mean, first, in graduate students, in essence. So uh, it's, it's extreme, number one, it's extremely important for us to renew ourselves, right? And to get uh, uh, new minds and new ways of thinking. Uh, DDN, like a lot of technology companies, are uh, aging of some sort because, you know, we got created 20, 25 years ago, and along the way, basically, our workforce has aged as well. So it is critical for us to be able to replace and add on and obviously augment our workforce with brand new talents. So what do we look for in students? Well, the obvious things, right? We look for innovative mindsets, so people that think out of the box, right? People that are self-starter. More and more with COVID, unfortunately, you're no longer looking at you know, environments where people sit in offices and you have 25 people in the office or 50 or 100 that they can share with. So there's certainly a different learning experience. That's a very big challenge for us, right? You, you onboard new talent. How do you train them? How do you make them efficient? And how also do they remain happy uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, and motivated in their job if they're in their studio apartment in New York, right? So that's a big challenge. We haven't resolved it yet. But uh, what we're trying to do is show them more than less. That means that we're trying to rotate them into various departments. I'll mention that later. And try to basically get them uh, uh, excited and finding the right route for their, uh, for their path and career. Technical acumen, right? We want people that are extremely good, right? I mean, uh, our customers are expecting the best. Uh, it's uh, efficiency is extremely important. So we have less and less, you know, we cannot resolve a thing. We're going to have to use AI. We're going to have to use very good people and technology and, uh, and knowledge to be able to resolve what, we fa what is facing us uh, over the future. And we will not be able to find enough experts. That's for sure. So we're going to need to do more. We're going to have to augment ourselves with AI and processes of let the more trivial task being done by machine and then basically the more uh, value at one being done with humans. So self-motivation, initiative, you know, those all are obvious, but we don't always find them. So again, if you have, uh, uh, we are augmenting uh, this, uh, uh, this program. We are uh, uh, accelerating and hiring, you know, several people in many departments. And so we need, we need talent. So if you know of anyone looking to join a, uh, you know, uh, successful, fun, and uh, thriving company, please uh, connect with us. Um, you know, that's a very small example of uh, one of our interns, actually. This is an intern, so it's a two-year intern that basically did a small project with LLM, uh, basically training some of our data on one of our products and getting basically able to, uh, to ask a question like you would commonly now know our chat GPT, but based on our own data sets, right? And this is basically just the uh, infancy of what we're going to be able to do. So what can one do at DDN? Well, a lot of great things, right? Number one, it's technical. It's highly technical, right? So graduates from a school of engineering will be, uh, will be uh, challenged, and uh, they will love that part. So it can be in software engineering, because we deliver and we, uh, we, uh, uh, we develop next generation file system. It can be in solution engineering. can be involved with customer. That means really ingrained or uh, sitting at customer sites, basically making sure that they get successful. And at that point, working with, for example, the teams like uh, Preston would have to augment and understand, you know, how do you optimize the whole chain, right? How do you basically uh, uh, optimize your network? How do you optimize your storage? How do you optimize basically file system to be able to get more out of your infrastructure? Uh, could be also in sales. That's a bad word, but uh, uh, at uh, DDN, we view sales as a very technical, consultative sale, which is why we have mostly engineers, right? Uh, the old days of uh, uh, going to a customer and saying, you know, do you want to go golfing or uh, go to dinner? That's kind of, uh, it's still maybe a little bit there, but it's certainly not uh, the point anymore. People are very time sensitive. They, when they are interested in something, they will want an answer very quickly, and they will basically make decisions much faster than ever before. So this is really one of the things that we're seeing in that kind of that uh, transition between HPC and AI is that in the, I'll call it the old days, right? It's about four months old. But in the old days, uh, the pre-chat GPT, 
uh, in a way, what you're looking at is, uh, you know, excruciating testing, right? Preston said, you know, AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, I'm going to test it and make sure that I get that technology right for the next purchase and so on and so forth. And what we're seeing is this is changing into I need to move on it now because people are moving on it faster than I am, right? So the cycles are accelerating, right? So what took two years now to make a decision is probably done in many uh, instances in, in a matter of weeks or months. And that's going to be part of my presentation whereby it's, it's, we're seeing a big shift over the past four or five months. So what do we do today, right? So we build data storage to drive the largest, the, the highest scale applications in the world. And when I say they're at scale, they're already de deployed, right? So we, we got lucky. Call it, uh, you know, you become, a, you know, it takes 20 years to be an overnight success. Well, we suffered for the past 20 years, right, with our HPC uh, environments to deliver technology at scale. And it was not easy, right? Today, compared to 20 years ago, whole different world. And, and it's going to basically uh, improve at an accelerated scale over the next couple of years with the size of the machines we're deploying today. So what you're looking at, what are you looking at? Show of hands. Who knows what we're looking at here? Good. So it's a massive, it's basically shelving where you're going to put your suits and ties. <laughs> Not really, no. So this is basically a, what you see, those uh, gold machines, these are NVIDIA DGX machines. And Emmet uh, from uh, NVIDIA will uh, talk further, uh, you know, after my uh, speech, but... Uh, uh, those are eight-way machines uh, that all, each of them holds about eight H100 GPUs. They're connected with a very fast interconnecting called NVLink, and across the board they are connected, right? So there's a massive, so if you look at it, this is what's called a super pod, right? So this was viewed to be a very large machine one year ago, right? So this was, you know, how many is that? Four? That's like 32, this is 32 nodes. That's what's pretty massive, right? So about 250 GPU. No longer at the forefront of technology. But this is still, so, but you're looking here at 32 node DGX. What you see in the center is all the high-speed networks. Very difficult, very challenging to get the right networks to connect these machines between the communication between GPU and the communication to storage. I mean, probably, I would probably qualify that in a deployment situation today, uh, designing the network properly is probably the most downing task, right? The DGX are gonna work, the data storage kind of works. Uh, I mean, actually works if you buy DDN. And uh, <laughs> this is just a tip to my competition. And uh, where is that fun? And so in the, and then the, 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 you know, kind of the yellow, red, uh, and uh, silver facing system, this is our DDN, right? This is really, if you look at it, it's about 10 nodes. Uh, they're viewed as one. It's fully scalable. Uh, so you get, exper uh, you have one performance in one. You can put 10 or 100. You're going to basically linearly scale your performance, your access in read, writes, I.O., so on and so forth. So where our role, the, so in essence, obviously, historically, you would have think that DGX is the most important thing, that's the compute, right? Then you have network to basically connect to it. But really as a uh, change in the market is now data is becoming extremely important, right? So storage was always kind of the last thought, you know, I, I'm spending X amount of million dollars, you know, how many petaflops am I gonna get? I need to be on the top 100 and I need to do this. Well, the game is changing a little bit. Now it's what are you gonna be able to extract from your data? Right? Yes, you're going to have all these very large machines, but what are you going to be able to do with your data? And that's the next shift that we're seeing, right? All of you, know, all of you guys, you know, faculty, students, you have your own data, you have your research, you have your, this is basically your IP, this is your value, right? What are you going to be able to extract from this over the next few years using AI? What are you going to be extract to share it with the rest of the world or democracies like Beth was talking, right? Democracies and AI. AI is going to permeate across, how are you going to use this? So, We've been fortunate of uh, working with NVIDIA from the onset about four years ago. Four or five years ago, uh, they looked at pretty much all the various storage so solutions and systems in the world, and they decided to pick DDN. We're certainly not the biggest one. We're certainly not the, uh, uh, you know, not the largest company or the, 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 the most resource, but we were the most technical. And the other thing that we could do that we proved, that we, uh, proved at the time also is that our technology could do checkpointing. 
right? And checkpointing at very large scale is extremely important. They had tried all the other technologies and they tried to do checkpointing. Checkpointing meaning you can have a simulation, right? LLM or other type of AI simulation. It could take four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks nowadays of your whole machine to work and, and create that one simulation, right? So unfortunately, electronics tends to fail, right? So you might lose, uh, you might lose a, a GPU, you might lose a network link, you might use something. If you do not checkpoint, you're going to basically be wasting a lot of your resources. So that was one of the elements where that made the decision with the, to go uh, NVIDIA to select DDN. It was also our parallel file system that was much uh, easier to use and performance-wise was bar none. That means that you could scale it to any numbers. So we deployed four years ago with Celine, which is an internally built uh, NVIDIA cluster. Uh, 500 of the uh, older DGX A100 based. A100 is the previous GPU generation. The new generation is the H100. And 500 at the time was massive, right? So what NVIDIA did extremely well and, and right is that they actually built this end-to-end -end solution and started doing research and science for themselves and outside companies to show what could be done, right? And I think they were the first kind of industrial company to really look at that element and say, we're going to build it first and then provide it to other companies, right? As opposed to just coming in and saying, hey, here's my GPU, go do whatever you want to do with it. And I think that's part of their success today is the fact that they basically built a very large ecosystem uh, to basically deliver all the various facets of AI. So DDN, we think we're obviously, as you can see, we're a small part of it, but we're a very important part of it because if you do not get access to your data and your storage, if you do not get those GPU humming, right, there's a massive investment, right? The core of the data, the core of your investment is going to be in the DGX and the network, right? We're probably usually, we're anywhere between 10 and 20% of the buy, right? So we're a very small portion. But if you do not get, but the, what we're able to do is deliver 90 to 99% efficiency in parallel across the board in network port as well as DGX or GPU connection. As a uh, overall uh, rule, uh, one GPU will require about one to two gigabyte a second of data storage. So Preston for your next design. If you buy a thousand GPU, you're gonna need about a terabyte a second. Right? That's downing, because if you look at it, Preston was saying, my system today does 20 gigabytes a second, and we're happy. Well, life is about to change. Right? We are deploying just, uh, and we'll talk about that later, but we're deploying systems today uh, over the past you know, couple quarters that are delivering 5, 10 terabytes a second. Right? Think about it we're able to move 5, 10 terabyte per second on an ongoing base, right? In the, so if you, have the tech, if you have the right simulation and the science that you're trying to achieve, this is what you're going to require. So AI, uh, again, it, it's, it's a short four years, and it's amazing actually what we've uh, been able to do already uh, in these four years just in AI, right? All these logos are doing AI. They're AI-centric. They're either countries that decided to build, like France, for example, or Sweden, that decided to basically fund an AI supercomputer two, three years ago, and those are now growing leaps and bounds, right? They're being used. So the other thing also is that what we're finding, like Preston said, right, he bought 100 and GPUs, they're already sold. Well, guess what? If you had 200, they'd be sold probably very quickly as well. So that is really kind of, I think, the challenge that's going to be for uh, EDU and government uh, uh, agencies is what is the right budget for me moving forward, right? What is going to hit me? And I need to be off the forefront. I cannot wait another year or two years to go to my administration and say, I'd like some money because someone else is going to do it faster than you and put you out of business. So it's an opportunity and a challenge for schools like Purdue because where are you going to size this, right? What, uh, uh, what technologies are you going to focus on and what are you going to need from your uh, user base uh, to be able to be efficient and deliver basically the value to your students as well. So you look at it, it's pretty much across the board. It's EDU, academia, precision medicine, inference, recursion, uh, trying to find uh, new drugs, being able to do simulation, thousands of simulation in a day, right, for drug uh, research. Um, 
uh, Brookhaven, uh, at, I mean, so you name it, basically, Vail Cornell, that's another uh, hospital. Uh, we do a lot of work with St. Jude. We do a lot of work in uh, autonomous, right, autonomous vehicle. Uh, that is driving a lot of requirements in data uh, due to the video analytics. So uh, we've been fortunate. We've learned a lot. I think the most important thing here is that we've learned a lot, and we are now quasi-ready for the explosion that we're seeing, right? You're never fully ready, but we are excited, actually. We are super excited because we like to learn. Uh, we like to partner with our customers and get them to the uh, further out limit. So uh, the amount of data generated each minute, I won't bore you with all the numbers. They're pretty self-explanatory, and those are going to keep growing. Uh, everybody wants to take uh, messages. Everybody wants to take videos. Everybody wants to send it all day long, create data. Uh, millions and millions of emails creating every minute. I mean, actually, 231, 231 million email each minute, number of messages. So we're creating data. We're creating data. And some of these data is going to be valuable. Some of it might not, but some of it will be valuable. And some of it, uh, some people will use this, right? Social media, we're seeing social media as a very big, uh, 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 at, at the leading edge of AI. Why? Because they're going to basically use all this data and be able to deliver uh, personalization, services, more knowledge about you, and so on and so forth, as you know. Good, bad, whatever it is. So we are in a new era, right? Because we've been delivering, you know, uh, the world has been delivering a lot of R&D, a lot of advancements across the board, right? Uh, you can talk about transportation, precision therapies, digital wallets, uh, biology, bioinformatics, 3D printing, autonomous, you name it. All these technologies have already been developed, right, and delivered, but now they're going to be catalyzed with AI. So you can get to a whole different level if you apply AI to any and all of these technologies. And that's what's interesting. It's downing, challenging, but it's so much fun, right? And again, for Purdue University, this is a chance for faculty, staff, and students to reinvent yourselves, right? Not going to happen overnight, but start thinking about it because it's happening very fast out there. Chat GPT revolutionized the world, right? We started the year saying, OK, it's going to be the same year as usual. Great, having fun. And then Chat GPT happened, and then the world changed. I mean, at our level, it's already changed. That means that. What we have seen in the second quarter and the third quarter is totally inordinate. We are seeing companies uh, go from, uh, we need to get into AI, we need to do either uh, internal chat GPT, or we need to do LLM and so forth, decision process within two weeks, right? From the first the talks to those companies to an actual purchase order to deliver systems, about two weeks. That, we've never seen that. So this is, we don't know if it's going to keep on going, but this is basically what the way industry sees AI. They see it as a do or die situation, right? And a lot of them, the big guys, are putting their money where their mouth is, which is why, you know, Emmett will tell you that H100s are very difficult. It's very difficult to get them. NVIDIA, in some ways, in some cases, is not taking orders from certain customers. It's, it's insane, right? There is more demand now for this technology than the production can allow. When has that happened in technology recently? I can't remember that. I can't recall that. So uh, interesting times. Evolution of AI, same thing. It's moving extremely fast, right? I recall uh, you know, AlexNet uh, being able to classify in a smart way uh, images, right, to be able to recognize you know, either on Google or elsewhere, uh, you know, what am I looking at? Uh, uh, also early days of uh, autonomous driving. Give you an idea to, to train this. Uh, it's about 262 petaflop in AI words, right? It's not the same as HPC petaflops. And, but this is a single, it's, it's, it's equivalent to a worm brain, right? So again, the same way, if you look at the amount of neurons and neural networks that you have, this is still pretty minimal. And this required a single GPU. And this is probably three, four years ago using AlexNet. Today, chat GPT, right, GPT-3, it's 175 billion parameters. Right? So we went from 61 million parameters to 165, 275 billion parameters. Once you go to chat GPT-4, you're going to be in the trillion parameters. Right? Trillion parameters, that's what you're looking at. And so for this, you need, you need GPUs, you need networks, and you need storage and data. And this is 
kind of the, the challenge because you are going to need pretty big iron to deliver those simulations in time. And time to market is going to be more important because, you know, if you're, uh, if you're Twitter, Google, or uh, any of the social media, um, you need to be first to market. And right now, ChatGPT is there. You better believe that the other guys are not going to see that at all, right? So that's just in that field. Then you have autonomous. Autonomous driving, you know, it's a race to get to a full autonomous. And for, to do that, you need to have about 6 billion miles proven or in simulation, right? So you need to show 6 billion miles on your software without any accident or any problem. That requires a lot of compute and storage as well. And what's interesting is a large-scale superbot is still the size of a fly brain. So that's the good news. The human brain, if you use it, it's pretty powerful. <laughs> the question is, how do you use it? And so that, I think, is going to be the fun part, is that there's nothing like a human, but we're going to get challenged. And either we are taking up the challenge or we're refusing the challenge. And it's not an easy situation, obviously, because that's going to create a lot of issues in the world. But I don't think you're going to stop that train. You might regulate it, but it's not going to stop. So AI infrastructure, at least in our world, right, we view it as a driver of a new economy. It will create new economy. If you listen to Tesla, right, Elon Musk tells you, I don't sell cars, right? I don't sell cars. What I'm going to do is deliver robo-taxis. I'm going to deliver, basically, autonomous situation whereby if you buy a Tesla, I'll be able, and you want to basically uh, use it and monetize it, you'll pick up, you'll leave at 2 a.m. from your house, go work and do Uber type of situation, till 10 a.m., be back, fully charged, for you to go to the office. If you go to the office, I'll go to Starbucks. So that's what you know, Elon's view is, is they're looking at technology to enable, basically, the business, and it is the driver for this. So NVIDIA expects to ship half a, half a Billion, no, half a million, I'm sorry, 550,000, right, of the, the GPUs this year. And my contention is I think that they're probably very busy trying to ship much more than that because the demand is over this. Because what we're finding is there's probably about 20, 30 companies, maybe slightly more in the world, that today are aiming to be at 100,000 GPUs as soon as possible. 100,000 GPU. That's what they think they need to be at scale. So picture that, right? You have university talking about 100, 200 GPU, right? 300 GPU. And then you have industry talking about 100,000 GPU. It's never happened before. So that's going to be interesting to see also how, you know, universities, government agencies respond to this because uh, that's going to be a problem, right? Uh, how do they respond? How do they basically grow again and view things differently to be able to, uh, you know, compete with commercial entities or deliver value as well? So GPT-5 will need 30 to 50,000 H100s, right? You'll take one simulation, it'll take 60 days. So this is what, what is being faced, you know, at the higher end of AI. Now, obviously, you know, Fortune 500, other companies research, uh, you know, it's trickling down. I mean, the, the, the mid-range more, and that's going to be obviously delivered in 24, 25. But we're finding that the very large size are happening right now. What we're also seeing is that there's new GPU cloud companies being uh, formed very quickly because a lot of companies cannot get to market fast enough or they, uh, they cannot get the systems and so forth. So what they're doing, they're basically going to specialized uh, uh, AI cloud uh, companies like Lambda, for example, or CoreWeave, that deliver ready-state solution, but they're much more optimized than a Google or an AWS would be that relies on much more legacy system. So the good news is that with these guys, they're going to run on uh, the latest and greatest H100s. They're going to run on great networks, and they're going to be, actually, in a lot of cases, they use DDN as well. But uh, uh, so, so again, we're seeing the market evolve extremely quickly, and, and everything's... Uh, uh, developing fast. Um, so the urgency, right, simple. Every AI, if you apply AI in every pro, I mean, most of the process can be improved with AI, right? So uh, uh, across the board. Uh, precision medicine, that's an obvious one. Uh, autonomous, uh, manufacturing, um, agriculture, I mean, you name it, it's permeating to every uh, single uh, industry. 
So urgency is because if you don't do it, basically, and someone's going to have a better service, better access to customers, better service to customers, better response, you know, more efficiency, uh, people-wise, they're going to basically have, you, you're going to have an issue uh, with, with your company. So um, real time, uh, everything's going to turn into more and more real time. We're seeing it with the LLM, Gen, uh, uh, Gen AI. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the time to market and the response to the questions are accelerating. So this is a, a chart that shows you how LLM have uh, evolved over the past few years, right? And what you can see here is that in a short three years, the models have increased over a thousand times, right? And the GPU memory has increased time five. Uh, when you're running uh, Bloom or um, uh, GPT-4, you're seeing trillion type, trillion style parameters. So uh, this is downing again. But the, the, what's going to be created with this technology, and, and picture the fact that right now ChatGPT uses data that is about four or five years old, right? So ChatGPT doesn't even have the data for the past four years, which is probably we've created much more data than the years before, right, over the past four years. So this is just the infancy. And I was reading an article yesterday, actually, with a, uh, with a teacher that tested ChatGPT, right, because you're in a uh, university situation, and... You know, students are like, where do I use ChatGPT, right? Can I do my homework? Can I do this? Can I do that? And it was interesting because uh, uh, the article said, yeah, ChatGPT does a lot of the tasks very quickly, but it's not as good as my students. But it's certainly going to help them, right, do a lot of the work, base work, and then use the brain to augment on it. But there's no doubt that he said, hey, ChatGPT is going to be back next year, and now they learn what they didn't know last year, right? So it's going to be constant, constant learning and so forth. So the way you know, we view this as those are technologies that are going to evolve and you need to embrace them more than basically be afraid by them and then see what value add you're going to be adding to this, make you more efficient, smarter, get faster to research. And, you know, where we see it already in medicine, some of the breakthroughs are going to be, uh, you know, accelerated with AI, so there's not, you know, it's, it's a lot of positive uh, being created. So... That's another example with Lama 2 training, right? It requires 3.3 million GPU hours, right? So literally 20 weeks of a super pod, just the power cost about 200 grand, right, to run that simulation. So again, there is a uh, uh, efficiency and scale is going to be very important uh, for your business acceleration. And these LLM, I'm going to basically deliver a lot of value, right? Picture eBay. eBay what you'll be able to do is say, listen, I have a uh, green uh, Ford. Uh, uh, actually, you don't even do that. This is my VIN, right? This is my VIN number. It's got 20,000 miles. Just put an ad to it, right? Never been an accident. Just create the ad, and I want 20 grand for it. Done. One click. This is the type of thing that you're going to be able to do, right? So again, that gives you back time to enjoy with your family and kids or to do more. So same thing, right, GPU and parallel storage. Why are GPU so successful nowadays? Because it's just more efficient for AI, for a training, inference, machine learning than CPUs. So typically, you have a factor, uh, you, you have more than 10x productivity um, and much less dollars. You have also the notion of accelerated computing. And I know that's kind of strange, because in one end, us manufacturers are telling you, you know, we're saving the planet. Are we saving the planet? We're delivering so much more gear, right? But what we're saying, so we're not saving the planet, but what we're saying is that at least we can do our part into delivering much more value within X amount of kilowatt, right? So I don't think we're going to limit and save the planet, unfortunately, with uh, equipment and, 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 uh, uh, and computers and storage and networks, but we can actually save a portion of it. And that could be actually 10x, 20x. If you are... Uh, if you have a notion of accelerated computing, you are saving a lot of power, space, uh, and efficiency, and it does make a difference at the end of the day. So that leads into my next slide, which is data centers need to become much more efficient. If you look at it, this is in, uh, I think it's in uh, the data, it's in exabytes or zettabytes, which is pretty down. It's in zettabytes, right? So in 25, which I'm missing the numbers, I think it's about... Uh, uh, something like 25 uh, zettabytes, that goes into 175 zettabytes, that goes into 2,000 zettabytes. A zettabyte is 1,000... What is it? Exabytes, right? So it's downing. 
and an exabyte is 1,000 petabyte. And a petabyte is 1,000 terabyte. So you're talking about 2,000 zettabytes in 10 years. So what are you going to be able to do? All this data is going to be valuable. All this data is going to be used and monetized. You can believe that. So we have to make it more efficient, right? So we have to make basically software that is uh, more intelligent. We have to make it uh, uh, faster links, uh, faster, uh, larger devices, right? Today, state of the art in a flash uh, drive is going to be 60 terabytes, right? So you're going to be able to have 60 terabytes in the palm of your hand. When I started my career uh, 40 years ago, uh, or 35 years ago, I hate to say that, but I will say it anyway. We delivered a, I think it was 20 megabyte, right? It was a 20 megabyte disk, and we were so proud of it. When I got a terabyte in my hand, I, I know, actually, when I got a, uh, what was it, 20 megabyte? I think when I got like a uh, 320 megabyte, I thought I was going to cry, which was so, many, so much, right? I always love storage in my life, so. So today, 60 terabyte. So in one rack, you can have basically 25, 30 petabytes, right? A couple of years, you'll have 50 petabytes. It's, it's never ending, right? So what I want to say is that the way of thinking also is evolving, right? We've been thinking gigabytes a second. Now it's going to be hundreds of gigabytes a second or terabytes a second or tens of terabytes a second. We will have a handful of system running at 50 to 100 terabytes a second before the end of 2024. And they will have probably between 100 and 500 petabytes of data attached to it. And this is the hot, that's the hot uh, file system, right? I'm not even talking about the cold file system behind, which will be in the exabytes. So what do we do? This is what we do. It's still the box, right? It's like that show. It's still the box. <laughs> it's the box. But that box does a lot. It does a lot in storage, in, uh, in software, I'm sorry. It took us about 10 years to get this, right? This used to be half a rack, right? So this kind of a 2U device used to take half a rack. We used to have metadata server, redundant storage uh, separate, network, its own network. We used to have the storage, the servers, and then the storage, and so forth. It took us 10 years to shrink this down and create accelerated computing in storage. So we eliminate cable, switches, and servers. Save the planet. We use very large capacity flash drive, and we double the capacity per watt. So again, you're going to lose, you're going to be much more efficient. One of those systems uses two kilowatt. Uh, we look at it also in intelligent pathing. So we're able to look at what sort of data you're going through. Is it small files, large files? Uh, what is your scenario? And we're able to basically go to the right device automatically, real time. So we're workload focused, and we actually end up speeding up application. And the most important thing is that we're 100% linear. That's very important. No other technology does that. That means you have one. You can get 90 gigabyte second reads, 65 or 70 gigabytes writes in a 2U situation. You can just multiply it, and you have predictive performance uh, with your cluster. So we can start small, right? So this is kind of the single DDN guy, 2U, with uh, four of the uh, uh, DGX A100 systems. Or we can grow to some of the largest planet, systems on the planet. So some of the largest systems that we've deployed, uh, to give you an idea, uh, past two, three months, uh, is 20,000 GPUs. And the only reason why it's not more is because they cannot get their hands fast enough on them, right? So 20,000 GPUs and 100 of our systems. So 100 of those systems deliver about 10 terabytes a second. Uh, actually, no, 100? Yeah, it's 10 terabytes a second. 10 terabyte a second. And the capacity, I think, is about 40 or 50 petabytes, right? And they're just starting. Even at the level of these companies, right, they still don't know what they're going to need in storage, data, predictability. They have that issue. They know they're going to need the compute. They still don't know, you know, fully what are they going to need in terms of data, storage. They're just starting. And we believe that they're going to need actually much more to be able to deliver once they're at full speed and full efficiency on their DGX. They're going to require more storage, actually, and more throughput because they will view that uh, the dollar you put in storage is basically pretty much free because they're going to get their more efficiency on their GPUs. So 
We're proud of this facility, stayed up uh, during COVID. We have our own uh, technology and integration center in LA. And uh, you can see actually with the mask, I think this picture was done during COVID, right? Because we, uh, we managed to stay up. We didn't, uh, I think we, we might have been closed down by California a couple of days and then we managed to get back as uh, essential services. And we basically kept on delivering technology all the way through COVID. So uh, in a very short period of time, Today, I think it's probably changed since uh, yesterday, but probably about 60, 70,000 uh, GPU that were directly connected to. Might be more because we don't know enough uh, about all the services we deliver now in the cloud, but you're looking at about a sub 100,000, and this is gonna grow to probably two, 300,000 uh, connection over the next uh, 12 months. Exabytes a second, right? So again, it's, it's downing. What, what uh, uh, the, the, the scale and uh, the amount of uh, uh, technology being delivered is growing exponentially. Now some example of applying AI, and I, I won't bore you too, 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 uh, too, too long on this uh, as my time is getting shortened, but uh, we got a prize in, uh, in Munich with Helmholtz uh, applying AI uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, sell uh, to uh, med uh, medicine design, drug design, right? And you look at the left side, it's kind of a, a trivial way of explaining it, right? We're using pictures of men with glasses, men without glasses, and women without glasses to basically infer women with glasses, right? So that seems pretty easy, but you know, it's, a, uh, it's done with AI. And the notion of that is that M. Holtz uses the same method to predict how a particular cell type would behave if you perturb basically with a new drug and to see at what happens with the other cells as well, right? So drug, uh, drug uh, research, drug discovery, companies like Recursion, uh, companies like uh, Garden doing uh, at the forefront of uh, technologies on AI uh, to basically find cure. Um, I met over the weekend with a, uh, uh, a Boston startup that basically uh, getting into testing now to cure cancer, right? They found a new way, or units data sciences, same thing, they're applying AI uh, to find uh, cures. Another one completely different, KLA. They manufacture massive systems that have a uh, uh, 20, 30 year uh, life, scale, life scale. And what they do and where they use AI is to basically find uh, defects that could be as small as 10 nanometer, right? And to minimize false positive when they design wafers, right? So basically, they're gonna design, they make, uh, they, they, they make 300, uh, the, the manufacturers, semiconductor manufacturer will have a 300 millimeter wafer and then they use a KLA machine to figure out, you know, um, uh, to, to, to cut and dice it and, and to basically image um, the, fi the, the, the 500 copies on the chip uh, on that wafer that will create basically uh, the, the chips, right? And so you have to, uh, within 10 millimeter, you have to, nanometer, you need to be able, they're applying AI and obviously high-res cameras to basically figure out what is a defect, what is false positive, to basically figure this out pretty quickly. Now I think we have a video, if it works, of some work we've done with NVIDIA. The Cambridge One system is one of NVIDIA's several different AI supercomputers that we use for developing software. Uh, NVIDIA invests billions of dollars a year in developing our AI and high-performance computing technology. Cambridge One is the fastest AI supercomputer in the UK. It's an example of our DGX SuperPod architecture. It brings together 80 of our DGX A100 systems. All our previous supercomputers had been used by NVIDIA engineers. When we built Cambridge One, we decided to choose UK medical partners because of the amazing medical research being done there. A lot of people don't understand why such big supercomputers are used for life sciences research. You think of life sciences as a bunch of researchers in a lab with test tubes. Today, a genome sequencer can sequence not one genome, but many genomes at a time with relatively low cost equipment. That data is being used as the inputs to AI, artificial intelligence, and is turning huge amounts of data into knowledge. In order to do this, one, you require a tremendous amount of mathematical calculations on the data, hence all the GPUs. But the other thing is, is the masses of data. You need to move the data from the storage through the network and get it to where the processing is done. And then you need to move it back again. Most supercomputers are custom built. The new breed of AI customers 
doesn't have experience building supercomputers. So we built one as a turnkey product. And that's where we actually started working with DDN. There are many important considerations when designing the world's most powerful AI systems. Storage is one that's often overlooked. As the data models get bigger and bigger, and the computation becomes bigger and bigger, you need more and more data. And it's not just about moving that data, it's about moving the data at the same time. The researchers, however, they don't want to be worried about the storage. They want their AI models, their data to be stored just as easily as an email is stored when you send it over the internet. In these large AI systems, hardware capabilities are just the start. The real differentiator is DDN's use of a parallel file system. And that's why every DGX SuperPod we've shipped has come with DDN storage. I never hesitate to recommend DDN. I know that if DDN can meet the demands of the DGX SuperPod, they can meet any of our customers' requirements. What I love about DDN, they're not new to high performance. They're the de facto name in high performance computing storage. And now by working with us, our DGX SuperPod, they're the de facto name for AI storage in high performance environments. Thank you, Mark. This was uh, Mark Hamilton, the head of uh, uh, sales engineering, social engineering at NVIDIA. So again, to, to summarize, you know, we do drive you know, some of the world's largest LLM. We are seeing, uh, I think we talked about that already, but massive expansion there. Um, and this is what takes, at this point, the largest amount of compute and storage from what we're seeing. So on your side, you know, what we're finding, you know, what are we going to see? Right? So today, we went from monomodal to multimodal in AI. Right? So you can. Uh, Literally, uh, simply uh, do a quick uh, search on ChatGPT and say, or actually on Dali, and say, I'd like a picture of a you know, crazy dog kayaking down white water, and this is going to be created in a matter of seconds, right? Or you, you want to write a bash script that gives you the amount of uh, V in a, a file, uh, you can get it. Uh, ChatGPT can write you that code in a, in, in a matter of uh, uh, seconds as well. And, or the same way, generate a 3D model you know, with the uh, 3D model of a cube, right, that you're going to basically then 3D print. Uh, ChatGPT can do this in a flash as well. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, not trivial, but I mean task that can be now completely automated with ChatGPT3. So what's the future? What's next, right? What can you do? And again, this is just a very small example because you can apply it to every, uh, every facet of uh, research in every vertical field that you can imagine. So intelligent X-ray, right? Intelligent, basically, you have your X-ray going through a machine. At that point, you can actually pinpoint and ask a very specific question about this, right? If you're looking for cancer or if you're looking for other type of issue, a tumor or whatever, you can basically guide the machine and saying, can you dig into this? And then it will give you basically a much more intelligent uh, diagnostic. Uh, you can have basically a translation engine from a brain uh, waves from paralyzed people to be able to get into a full uh, speaking, you know, I call it a deep fake uh, uh, speak, uh, translating speech and language fully uh, on a screen, right? So we're close to this. And then the last one is uh, just one that I, I, um, uh, we spoke about with the customer that basically what they're doing is they're, uh, they're digitizing, I mean, they're basically filming people in a room, right, using Wi-Fi and a camera. And once they have your model, basically just using Wi-Fi in the rest of the building, they can decide who it is, right? So they can know that once they have basically, uh, once they've uh, recorded uh, your movements and your posture and the way you are, they can know exactly that, you know, Preston's going to be in the third uh, floor or whatever. Who is it basically sitting in the third floor of the building? Just using Wi-Fi, right? So again, uh, applications are numerous. So just to start. Just to start, what's next? I don't even know. I mean, it's just uh, uh, the, the uh, all I know is that the, uh, the, the speed of creation is going to accelerate. Uh, we thought we would be, it would take, we, we, we believe that with the latest uh, uh, acceleration in technology, in software models and, uh, uh, and code, um, what we would see in, 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 uh, at this point, where we, where we thought we would see six months ago or eight months ago in 15, 20 years, we're going to see in five, six years. So the cycles are basically shortening themselves very fast. So what's next for DDN? Well, um, we've been working on a next generation file system. 
uh, for the past six, seven years. It's not replacing the current one we have, but it's gonna be a, uh, we call it the next generation for the future. So on-prem, in the cloud, instantiating as software or appliances. That's gonna be basically uh, be able to be workload-centric, intelligent in fashion on, on uh, uh, guarantee of service, and being able to basically deliver um, you know, access to data in a simpler, more efficient, and uh, cost-efficient manner. So appreciate it, thank you very much. And I did it on time. Usually I'm always late, so it's good. Yes? I have one which is probably not AI related, but it is related to something that I know you're good at, is the good old hidden hard disk. Is it, is it dead or is it going to survive? So, Same thing, uh, the answer, if you asked me six months ago and today, very different answer, right? So um, our technology, so what you saw in that 2U, that is kind of the brain of the operation, right? And it's got 24 NVMe uh, flash uh, disk in there. And then what you can do is you can actually connect under this unit, you can connect um, uh, enclosures that either use TLC, QLC flash, or hard drives, right? So we've been obviously known, and historically we've delivered a lot of system with hard disks. So, so to your answer, we can do any of the above, right? So we can still manage and deliver. However, what we are seeing is that the, 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 the hard disk uh, uh, R&D and the capacity is not keeping up, right? With the capacities on flash, right? So hard disks are actually growing from 14 to 16 to 18 to 20, 22, right? So today, state of the art is 22 terabyte. Um, flash is already gonna be at 60 terabyte before the end of the year. And then you, you, you basically uh, mix this with the fact that, you know, IO-wise, a disk can do less than 200 IO, and a, a flash device can do 100,000 IO or million IO, I mean 100,000 of IO. You know, it be, the, 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 that, that effect and that value, even if it becomes like at the end of the day, it might be 2x or 2.5x, some of these elements will make you pick, you know, go towards more flash eventually, right? Because you're going to have uh, um, less power, less, uh, less, uh, um, uh, less ports needed, less equipment, and you're going to be able to be much more varied to your use cases, right? So when it comes to smaller files and so forth, a lot of small files being created with AI, much better suited for Flash and, and QLC. So disk, I don't think disk is dead because at the same time, right, it's the same thing. Tape has been supposed to be dead for the past 20 years, right? And uh, people are still buying a lot of tape libraries. So the, uh, I think the disk will be relegated. I think that their share of the wallet is gonna become you know, less. Uh, so they're not gonna disappear, but there's no doubt that Flash TLC and QLC is gonna grow exponentially. Do we have any other questions? Back. Thank you very much. One more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, one, one second. At least we'll bring you the microphone. <laughs> you said that networking is going to be the greatest significant challenge for high performance computing in the future. What are the the cyber infrastructure skills that you think engineers need now? That's a whole best, different layer, yeah. Your best I mean, engineers, and then what do you think? You're just, you're just peeling the fight? onion here. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, uh, tremendous. I mean, obviously the secure aspects, and, I, and, and I'm turning on an expert there, right? But uh, for example, I mean, our system, you know, we are self-encrypted. We provide the, uh, various level of encryption. Uh, our customers are extremely uh, uh, sensitive to this, right? Uh, so uh, I would say we, we, we have partners to deliver, we have solutions to this, right? We have ways to, uh, uh, we have, um, on our side, we've modified some of the root access, some of the prevention. We're also working with NVIDIA on what's called DPUs, right? To separate the notion of access to your actual data, right? So anything that basically prevents unauthorized access to your uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, um, you know, massive, obviously, uh, as, the hackers have access to more power, you know, to more compute the same way, right? They have access to uh, uh, getting smarter at getting into your data. And there's always a notion of, uh, you know, uh, so far, historically, it's probably more human, uh, you know, human uh, 
uh, errors and the fact that you respond, you know, and open a uh, un un uh, unwanted uh, attachment that basically going to create some issues. But uh, um, customers are intent. I mean, obviously, it's 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 one of the it's a large issue on top and above us. But we work with the customers. But we're certainly a very uh, you know we 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 don't handle it per se uh, directly. Okay. Any more questions? If you don't mind, Paul, I want to ask a question about entrepreneurship. Since you are an engineer turned um, leader um, and you know, building and founding a company and everything, I know that at Purdue we're doing a lot more emphasis on entrepreneurship and business. And I was just wondering if you might be able to address that for some of our students in the audience. So entrepreneurship, I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, um, I think I've worked for a company probably less than a year, the time for me to get a green card. So I think you, 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 you feel, you know, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I think if, if you feel you're an entrepreneur, my, 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 my advice would be uh, start as early as possible because once you work, you go into the workforce, uh, if you're good, the companies are gonna basically uh, give you, uh, the compensation is gonna be good enough or much better than what you would uh, get at the beginning of a company. And so you could be tempted to basically stay into that position and it becomes a cushy situation, you have great stock options, why create your own stuff, right? Um, although nowadays, you know, the world has changed as well. If you have a great idea, you can get funding and get kind of your eight and eight two, but at the same time, you're gonna have to basically uh, be dealing with VCs and uh, financial partners. So we kind of did it the hard way. Uh, we were involved with VCs early on. Uh, we had first a, a handwriting recognition company. So right out of uh, Caltech, we created Talk about a different problem. I mean, back at the time on digitizing tablet going into a Macintosh Plus, we created a handwriting recognition uh, uh, real-time software. And uh, um, probably not the best uh, uh, use of our time at the time, but uh, we got a lot of TV and recognition because at the time nobody wanted to tap on a keyboard. Um, and at the time we had VCs uh, and environment, it didn't go that well. So when we created Mega Drive and then DDN, we decided to uh, uh, do it the hard way and uh, we didn't get any funding. So we kind of uh, tightened our belts and uh, did it the hard way. And uh, uh, we're very proud of that today because obviously we're fully independent, right? So we believe uh, we, we don't want to go public because it would basically um, uh, kind of uh, uh, defocus us from our mission, right? To be able to, for example, on this next generation file system, we've been deployed, we've been uh, investing tens of millions of dollars into a net new technology uh, over years and years and years, right? If we had a board, maybe, you know, if we had a, uh, uh, you know, VC and so forth, maybe they'd say that doesn't make sense. So to us, it's worked well, basically staying independent, growing with our team, managing and motivating our team and staying private to basically focus on customer satisfaction and, uh, uh, and, and being profitable as well. Actually. We've always felt that uh, being profitable uh, helped us keep that independence. So entrepreneurship, there's so much to be created. To me, there's never been a better time, right? AI is one of the facets, but everything can be reinvented. If you're in engineering, code, um, uh, the, the toys that you have today are better than they've ever been before, right? It's how you're gonna use those toys, right? It's how creative you're gonna be. So if I was like a 20, 25 year old student at this point and I was good at what I'm doing, I definitely would be looking at either a startup or go and join a very, uh, a very, I would say interesting company where I can add a lot of value, learn, and then create my own. But uh, entrepreneurship is great. I mean, I, uh, I, I can't say anything against it, but it's, uh, uh, it's painful. It's not for everybody either, right? Um, and, uh, but if you're ready for it, it's the best. Thank you. Thank you.